Okay, um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Felix. Um, I'll be talking about how we do full waveform inversion um, on time lapse seismic data using ideas from distributed compressive sensing. So it's not going to be a talk on distributed compressive sensing, but rather it's going to be an application of a model we have adopted from the field of distributed com compressive sensing and how this model has been very useful throughout the entire processing flow of uh, time-lapse seismic data. Okay, so um, this is uh, joint work with Rajiv and Henny, um, who passed away earlier this year. Um, much of the work we've done here is um, being attributed to his uh, involvement. Um, so in summary, what I'll be talking about is a very new way in which we can invert time-lapse seismic data. And particularly, this is an extension of work I presented earlier uh, in June at the EAG, where we can, as we can actually deal with data that has gaps, especially when there are gaps in the data as a result of platforms, maybe in the surveys. And um, the results I will show here are much better compared to when you do some other kind of inversion on the, on the, on the, on the data. Okay, so we've seen this formulation, but it's written in a different way here. This is basically this, the problem of a full waveform inversion, where the objective is to find model parameters that are characterized by, by M, or maybe in some cases, in the source wavelet, um, given that you have the observed data and you have a computer code that gives you uh, synthetic data from your studying model. So this is the problem you, you try to solve in full waveform inversion in a least square sense. And if you know the source wavelet, then what happens is you know, the alpha is no longer going to be there, Sorry, that shouldn't be there. We, only, we just want to minimize, find the solution M that actually explains this data misfit. Okay, so this is basically what we want to solve. In summary, we've had a lot of talk about the conventional way of doing full waveform inversion. So you, have a, you start with a starting model. Via some process, you compute a gradient, and then you update that model. So you repeat, this is an iterative process, and that is what full waveform inversion does. So give us some stopping criterion, you find a final model that is expectedly supposed to fit the observed, the, uh, the, the observed data. Well, instead of doing um, the standard way, um, in 2012, Zhang Li and others actually proposed a way of you know, regularizing the problem. Basically, you linearize the problem and you introduce a kind of L1 constraint. So you're no longer looking for the model perturbations, but instead you're looking for X. X are coefficient or covalent coefficient vectors that explains the model perturbation, basically that explains the update. So we're looking for, we're finding the solution X, S has to be sparse in the covalent domain, and C is the covalent transform operator. Again, the grad F here is the Jacobian. So if you have your, your, your forward model and you have the adjoint, then you can actually solve this problem subject to the fact that those coefficients are sparse and then the one norm of those coefficients are less, are less than some, some tau. So you, instead of getting the M, you actually get X, uh, X of K, and then you update your model from the starting model using the, the transpose of the covlet on the final the solution vector when you solve this problem. So this is what is called modified gauss newton and more details about how this method is applied and other examples can be found in this, in this paper. Um, in the next slide, I will just br briefly summarize what that modified Gauss Newton tries to do. So you, you start with, um, basically you start with from low frequency, frequency continuation strategy as well. You start with, uh, with, a sm with a frequency bash. At the first iteration, you maybe you start with, a sta with, with, you get a starting model. And then you draw a subset of shots. Basically you have this, maybe you have several shots. You don't use all the shots in the inversion. At every step of the inversion, you only use a few of those shots. So randomly selected shots from the entire shot of data that you have acquired. So that is what this RM stands for. This RM is just an operator that selects shots from the measured data. So the delta D here is just the subset of shots from the capital D. And using um, the standard way of, the, of, of uh, the, 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 pr the problem I showed here, solving this problem, you can get delta M, which is now the gradient 
or the gradient at that particular state. And then you update your model. Then you go again, you draw a new set, you can draw a new set of shots, and you continue this process until you get to a point and you move to the next frequency batch, and then you continue this process until you complete the, uh, the entire frequency batch to, to which you want to uh, do your inversion. So that is basically a summary of what this approach does. So you could either do randomly selected shots, or you could do like a source encoding where you hit all the shots with a random weight. So that is what you call simultaneous shots. But in this case, in this talk, I will only focus on where you on uh, randomly selected shots from is maybe sequential or randomly acquired shots. Okay, so in time-lapse FWI, what do we want to do? Usually you have a baseline data, which I'm, I'm going to denote by D1, and then you have a starting model from, for, for your inversion, M0, and then usually you have a monitor data, which I'm going to denote as D2. And then the objective is to invert for the baseline, get a good estimate of the baseline, velocity mo model or density model, and get a good estimate for the monitor model. And then when you subtract the two, you should be able to interpret the changes that are due to production effects, which is the subtraction of M1 from M2. So that is what we try to do. So if you have a good baseline and a good uh, monitor inversion result, then the difference between them should be easily, you, sh you should be able to interpret the changes in the Earth model from that difference. So that is simply what time-lapse FWI tries to do. And there have been several approaches to dealing with this problem. Um, a very common one is what is called the parallel difference method. What that means is you start with a similar starting model for the baseline and for the monitor data. So you use the same starting model to get, um, you invert for the baseline and the monitor separately. So you get an estimate M1, M2, and then you subtract the two of them, M1 and M2, to get the time-lapse difference. And then you do the interpretation from that. Then uh, another, another approach is to do the sequential difference method. Uh, that simply means when you start, you start with the baseline data, you invert for the baseline, you get M1, then you use that inverted result, the M1, as a starting model to invert for the monitor. And then you get the, the model M2, and then you again you subtract to get the difference between the two. So this is actually better when, this is preferable when the two geometries between the surveys, the baseline and the monitor, are completely, no, they are not exactly the same. So that is when people, some people try to adopt this. In this one, usually if the geometries are also not the same, you can also do this. But we will see um, another approach where, another approach that relies on exact, exactly repeating the geometry. That is called the double difference or the differential FWI. This is the difference between the observed monitor and the uh, observed baseline. This relies on the fact that you are able to exactly repeat the two surveys. Then so that you can actually subtract the baseline from the monitor. So but the objective here is to minimize the difference. Rather than minimizing the, uh, of minimizing the, the, the models, you actually minimize the difference between the observed data and the difference between the uh, forward model synthetic baseline and the monitor data. So what you, do, what you do here is you start with the baseline data, you invert for the baseline, and then you don't use the uh, originally acquired monitor. Instead, you construct a composite data, a composite monitor data, which is the difference between the true, sort of the measured difference and the synthetic baseline that you obtain from your uh, synthetic baseline data obtained after inverting the original baseline data. And that is what you have here. So you add this up, and that, is gives, that gives you the composite data. So you replace D2 with that composite data delta D2, and then you get um, an estimate of the monitor. So this method has been shown to sh work by, by these guys, has been shown to be very useful for computing the difference, but it doesn't really give accurate results for the, the, the vintages themselves, basically the, the monitor uh, velocity, but it gives good results for the, for the, for the difference. Um, more recently, this has also been proposed because this is an evolving field. There has been new additions of how you can do um, FWI on time-lapse data. But the major thing I want to draw here is that this is, uh, this the, the, the second equation here is basically the double difference term. So that's an incorporation of 
um, the minimization of the difference and introducing some kind of regularization on the baseline, the monitor, as well as the difference. Then you need to include some kind of weighting and some, uh, and, 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 um, some kind of mask on the data so that if they are not exactly at the same locations, then you can actually subtract them. So, but that is all work that is being done and is in the literature. But today I'm going to show you how we think about time-lapse data, how we, a new idea that is completely different from all I've been talking about. Okay, so again, this is the modified Gauss-Newton setup. What I've just done here is to write it in terms of how you solve two problems for i equals one and two, where one is the baseline and uh, two is the monitor. So for each of them, independent inversion implies you invert for the baseline using modified Gauss-Newton, and then you invert for the monitor, again, using modified Gauss-Newton. At this point, you may want to decide, you may decide to use the same starting model, or you may use different starting model. Um, but in my talk, I'm going to show that I'm going to use the same starting model, similar to what the parallel difference uh, method uh, describes. Okay, so that is what we do for independent inversion. And um, now here's the part I'm going to spend a little bit of time because this is the model that sort of characterizes what our joint inversion uh, uh, involves. So the joint inversion, the joint inversion, what, what it does is you think you, you, the model is, the model thinks, we think of the baseline and the monitor as consisting of three different vectors. Okay, so if you think of the baseline x1, x1 is just a representation of the baseline as a sum of two vectors, z0 and z1. And x2 is a representation of the monitor as a sum of two vectors, z0 and z2. So we recognize the fact that the baseline and the monitor share a common component and then they share uh, innovations. These innovations are different. But these common components are the same for the baseline and the monitor. And in this setup, you can formulate, you can set up a linear system of equations. So this equation here, this is a matrix A times Z times B. It's just the same as A, A1 times X1 is B1. That will give you the, 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 the baseline. And A2 times X2 equals B2. That gives you the monitor. So if you have your baseline and monitor data, you can form this block, this two by three block, and invert for Z. Instead of inverting for X1 and X2, you invert for Z, and from Z, you can extract each of these components that will give you a better uh, representation of the solution for X1 and X2. So that is what the joint recovery model does. So we exploit the common information, which is this Z0. The baseline and the monitor are not completely different. So why should we solve them independently? Why can't we use the information the share in our inversion? And that is what we try to do here. And we've applied this you know, uh, on, in the data domain. We've looked at how to interp uh, interpolate um, time-lapse data with missing traces from baseline and monitor. We've looked at incorporating this into an NMO stacking operator. We've looked at uh, recovery of time-lapse data from, um, say, simultaneous acquisition or time-jittered marine acquisition. And uh, like I said, we've looked at how you can use the same model for different acquisition geometry, and most recently, how we apply this to just least, least squares migration. Um, so that is some of, those are some of the works we've done on this already. And in, the, in this joint framework, what I've done is to give a very uh, a mathematics representation of the problem we try to solve exactly in FWI. So in FWI, we minim we'll solve this problem where the B and the A are as described. So the, uh, the, what we know here is we know the observed data D1 and D2, and we have a forward modeling kernel that gives you synthetic data. That is the F there. And then we just form this. These are all operators. We form these operators A, and this is a vector B. And then you solve this problem. Then you get estimates of Z0, Z1, and Z2. And at every iteration, you update the baseline, and you update the monitor at the same time. So that's a simultaneous or a joint inversion that you do in one go. OK. so. We've seen this uh, BG compass model, and we're going to use this because of the heterogeneity the, 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 and the velocity kickback somewhere here. We use that as our baseline. And the interesting thing about the BG model is that it's a symmetric part of it, and that is what we're going to use as our monitor. So if I subtract the two, what you see there is the gas cloud. 
So that gas cloud is, the, is what we would like to see. That's, the, that's like our time lapse anomaly that we would like to see from our inversion. So that is what we would like to see. Um, again, as we switch away from inversion, you need a very good starting model. So we choose to use this initial starting model, which is very close to the, just a smoothed version of the uh, baseline model. And then we're going to do this modified gauss Newton. What I've written here is just the steps that we follow, or basically the uh, acquisition geometry and the steps we follow in the inversion. Um, jittered shots, that is the shots are sampled such that the gap between any, any two consecutive shots is not too big. And then we have co-located sources and receivers. And then we do frequencies from 3 to 22.5. Again, um, good velocity background model is needed. And then we use randomly selected shots. Like I said, randomly selected shots, we draw new shots from that bucket of shots every time during the, uh, during the iteration. OK, so um, for the monitor, we exactly do the same thing. But it, the, the, the point is, the point I want to draw for the monitor is that the shot locations are not the same with the baseline. Or every other thing um, in the inversion process is exactly the same. So we use the same starting model. So that's exactly what I've just said. Geometry is exactly the same, same starting model, the same number of iteration for the baseline and for the monitor. OK, so on the top there is the true baseline. That's the starting model. And this, the bottom here is the inversion result. OK, the inversion result is very close to the true model. Obviously, we've done a couple of iterations. We have a starting model, a very good starting model. So we would expect a very good result for the inversion. And then when you do joint inversion, that is what you get. Uh, if I toggle back and forth, it may be difficult to see any difference at this point. But if you look at the lower part here, it starts saying differences between the joint inversion and the independent inversion. But that is not the end of the story. The, the, if you look at the difference, if you look at the difference, subtract the baseline from the monitor, um, on the, the middle here is what you, what you get when you do independent inversion. But when you use the joint inversion framework, this is what you get. It's obvious that the joint inversion gives you clearer time-lapse image compared to the independent inversion. You have a lot of artifacts below the gas clouds that may be misinterpreted as time-lapse, uh, true time-lapse events. Okay, so that is what we've seen. So where there are differences in acquisition geometry, these differences you know, crop into the time-lapse difference, and th those may be very difficult to, to, to interpret if you do it independently. All right, now, let, let, let's look at a more realistic scenario. By that, I mean you have a monitor acquisition where there are gaps. Basically, you don't have any sources and receivers on, on top of, especially on top of the gas cloud. What, how would that impact the acquisition or the time-lapse result? So there are no sources in this area. There are no receivers. You only have sources and receivers outside that gap. So what would you do? How would that impact the result? Okay, the same setup for the inversion. Again, all repeated. But the only difference is that now there is a gap in the monitor. Okay, so let's start with a small gap of 500 meters. What does that mean? You have a 500 meter gap between the side, and you perform your inversion. This is what the true uh, the inversion result looks like when you do independent inversion. Clearly, we don't see because you don't see any significant imprint of that gap because the gap is just very small. That's for independent inversion. And then you look at joint inversion, that is what you get. But when you, when, when you subtract the two, when you subtract the two, this is what independent inversion gives you. We start seeing the imprint of that gap in the difference. That's the imprint of the gap. But when you look at joint inversion, this is what the result looks like with the joint inversion. Again, I go back and forth. The time lapse is what what is more interesting to look at here because you see the imprint of that gap and the difference in the acquisition geometry all coming into the, into the time lapse uh, image. We'll go further to 1,000 meter gap. We're pushing it now. Now there's a bigger gap, 1,000 meters from this point to that point. Again, look at the independent inversion result. Now we start seeing imprints, especially below the gas cloud of that gap. When you look at joint inversion, this is what you get. This is independent and this is joint. Look at the time lapse differences. This is independent, and this is joint for 1,000 meter gap. So clearly, the, what the, 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 the joint inversion is it's correcting for some of the artifacts that you see you know, when you introduce those gaps and when there are differences. Now, what of a gap of 1,500 meters? A very big gap. Now, no, there are no sources there. There are no receivers. This is what you get with the independent inversion. Clearly, this has, it's not close to the true model. But when you do joint inversion, that is what you get, even in the presence of that 1,500 meter gap. 
Um, so, you know, that's the true time lapse. This is the difference, uh, the, 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 what you get with independent inversion, and with joint, you get that. So, you can start seeing significant improvement with the joint inversion, particularly in the time lapse response or time lapse image compared to independent. Now, when I put all of them together, just uh, on the left here is independent inversion, 500 meter gap down to 1500 meter gap. And if, you know, if by just looking at both of them, you can clearly infer that the joint inversion works far better than the uh, independent inversion. So to conclude, um, we've, seen, we've seen that uh, you know, independent FWR on time-lapse data is prone to errors, especially you know, when there are gaps, if you look, especially when you look at the time-lapse difference. And these acquisition gaps can create a lot of uh, errors in the time-lapse difference, which we can suppress using uh, our joint inversion. And this joint inversion, like I said, is based on ideas from distributed compressive sensing. And we're able to, re this is very important, we're able to reduce those inversion artifacts that may have arise either from the differences in geometry or because of the presence of the gaps in the model. And they, they are, they, the key idea is that you know, we're exploiting the shared information between the baseline and the monitor in our own joint inversion. And that, uh, I think, wraps up my talk. Thank you.